Hi, my name is David Russo. I'm a film and television composer. Um, although I've been doing almost TV almost exclusively for about 20 years now. Most recently, I scored this show Gotham. We did five seasons of that, 100 episodes. And then there was a spinoff for HBO called Pennyworth, which is the origin story of Alfred Pennyworth, which might sound dumb, but it's a really good show because it's, it's like a political thriller, nothing to do with superheroes, uh, really good. And it takes place in an alternate London in the 1960s. Um, and then I've just done, over the years, um, earlier in my career, I worked for a composer, Graham Ravel, as his assistant and did a lot of movies with him. I think we did 60 movies together, but I worked on Sin City and uh, Insider with uh, Al Pacino, Academy Award winning film. And, um, and then we did a couple of Robert Rodriguez films. Uh, we did Grindhouse, uh, Death Proof, the, uh, what have we done? We did uh, Denzel Washington, Out of Time, which is a great um, kind of thriller. Uh, let me see, uh, did the first season of CSI Miami. I mean, it's been all over the place. And then prior to that, uh, I was in a band that was signed to Epic Records. We did had three releases in the early 90s. And then when the band blew up, then I worked in the studio with Rage Against the Machine, had a relationship with Tom Morello. He had a period where he was doing a bunch of remixes. So I was, he was he and I in a room and I was doing, it was early days of Pro Tools. So I did a lot of that stuff. Um, toured with Cheryl Crow, a uh, European tour with her, and I was kind of the guy behind the stage adding all kinds of stuff. And worked in, in the sh uh, studio with Cheryl a few times. Worked in the studio with Rock Rick Rubin. I mean, it's just been all, like you said, you wear a lot of hats, just all over the place. So um, and here I am, <laughs> you know, here I am, that's it. Yeah, uh, working as an assistant for Graham Ravel, that was like, um, it, was an, it was an amazing apprenticeship because what I realized is I had always approached composing from a purely emotional standpoint. I'm not an intellectual. You know, I come from crazed Sicilians. It's my bloodline. So there's just, it's always emotion. So working with Graham, Graham is, he was almost like a machine in terms of how analytical he was about a given project. So he taught me how to break down a, a project, break down storylines, themes, look at it really, really um, categorically so that I could say, mm, this theme works here and it could, it could happen again here. So I learned how to, it was a lot of time saving. And also working with Graham, I was sitting in on spotting sessions with amazing directors and learning that process of discussing a work and what it needs, how to support the story. Um, very, really, very instructive. Um, and then, you know, just thousands of hours of hands-on, you know, probably did the Chronicles of Riddick, which is a massive film. Uh, and, you know, like the, when you're working for a composer, there's a very gray line between composing and assisting and, you know, who's writing what. But we would go and um, he would ha we would ha we would sit down and come up with themes, and then he would go off to his yacht, and then I would sit here like uh, Bob Cratchit, you know, grinding away and creating percussive beds and you know pr uh, orchestrating in a certain so coming up with sounds, and also when we were doing that, it was really in the early days of these digital libraries. So he we were creating a lot of our own libraries. Um, I have the guts of a piano in there that we were always banging on and, and um, bowing, you know, oil drums and just all that kind of stuff. So we put a lot of effort into that in those early days. And that was a great, um, again, a great education in terms of engineering. It's like we were saying, you wear a lot of hats. So uh, in this job, you're equal parts composer, player, engineer, all that stuff. I don't know. I'm born and raised here. The only reason I think I have a career is because of my friends, people that I met in my life that have opened doors for me and created opportunities. Would that have happened if I weren't here? I don't know. Um, I was, it was like a, it was a luxury to grow up around and just happened across people who became my friends 
who were in the same kind of the boat as me and had passion for this industry and and we knew each other and helped each other. Uh, so I, I, you know, I imagine it makes a difference. I think it's probably good to be here and to be out and about and to meet people. It's not easy, you know. And again, I had an advantage uh, because I was born here. There is one producer, Danny Cannon, an amazing kind of writer, director, producer, artist, musician, and he has kept me gainfully employed for 20 years. One guy. And I've done other projects along that way, but we have a relationship and a shorthand where um, I've, I've had the, the luxury of not having to do that. And also I've been really busy, uh, but also it's not my DNA to go out and network. I'm awful at it. I'm just, because it feels like lying and I, I can't do it. So uh, again, I've just, I just try to maintain the friendships that I have and show them the respect they deserve. And it's pretty simple. Uh, one guy that's been really instrumental in my life is a guy named Tim Simonek. We met, I was uh, scoring a film in college, in the UCLA, and the, the director got free studio time at a studio in Hollywood. Uh, we go in there and in the next bay is this guy who just is a loud mouth, just a gre big gregarious guy. And we start talking next thing we, we go to dinner and he's been a lifelong friend. And he's the one that said to me, oh, uh, when I got out of college and I was completely lost, he said, oh, I know a, a, they're looking for a secretary in the music department at Paramount. And that suddenly I'm at Paramount and I'm running down the hall every week, all the time looking at stage M where I'm seeing John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, James Horner. I mean, all these composers record in that place. Uh, and Tim went on to become orchestrator, conductor for Michael Giacchino and did all of Michael Giacchino's films. And then... Um, Tim was also the one who said that Graham Rebell is looking for an assistant. So he's huge uh, and he's always recurring. Um, and there's another uh, filmmaker, t producer, director, writer named Dwayne Clark. And he really is the one at the very beginning who, I mean, the first film I ever did at UCLA was for him. And, I've, and he opened so many doors for me and I've worked with him so many times. So those guys are huge. Because I've done so much work with Danny over these past few years, we've done, I don't know, six series, eight series, two films, all that, just so much stuff. Uh, we have a thing where we, early on, we sit down and have dinner and we have a conversation about the characters and the story and where these characters might go. Um, and because he's so knowledgeable musically, he'll, he'll say, you know, uh, this inspires me, or this inspires me, or this sound palette inspires me. And then I'll go for, away for a month and just write music, free from story, free from, you know, from anything, um, just whatever is inspiring to me. And then we meet again and I play it for him. And then he'll say, that's awful. I would, you know, that's wrong for this, or I like this, or go that direction. Um, and the greatest uh, compliment he ever gave me was that the stuff that I did affected his writing following that collaboration, which was really made me feel great because there was something that I saw in the character that he wasn't necessarily feeling and then it opened the door for him. Um, so that is, that's our process and a back and forth. Uh, I'm like a monk. I get up every day, 5.30 or 6 o'clock. Every day is the same coffee, walk the dog, and come out here and get working. Uh, and over the years, um, I've discovered that the mornings work for me. So, uh, yeah, I'm like a robot. Like, you know, you'll work for four hours, stop, go exercise. The dog is good because he makes me stop and get out of here in regular uh, intervals. Um, and that's it. And now it's also, I'm 60 years old, so there is... Uh, there is an issue of trying to maintain my energy. I, I see that I can't go as long as I did, and I have to maintain it. And exercise is a big part of it. Uh, but, you know, and there are no holidays. It's like you work seven days a week, right? I don't. I, I rarely even know what day of the week it is because it doesn't matter. 
holidays, who cares? You know, so if, if you have a project, it's just there. You have this body of music you have to address. So then it's just using your hours to, to accomplish that. Again, that's going to completely depend on what the scene requires. So what is the compelling emotion we're going for? Is it something that needs rhythm? It's a big question. Um, is it about it's just a mood? Is it about a melody? You know, I think you have to look at each given scene and feel it. And then find some entry point into that. It might be a sound. And you never know what's going to be. Hard not to repeat yourself, too. So you're always trying to find a new way of expressing what you've expressed, you know, a thousand times before. Like, oh, it's an action cue. What am I going to do here? Yeah. Can I find a different solution? So that's, the, that's the big challenge. Um, I can think of Pennyworth because that was a recent one. And that was, a lot of the TV shows I've done haven't had a, an opening title because there's so much story they're trying to get in. They didn't have time. But with, because Pennyworth's HBO, there's no time constraint, they said, let's do it. And they did a beautiful main title. And so for that one, um, and it turned out to be a theme that has really served the show. Um, it's heroic, but it also works. We can or orchestrate it in sad and sentimental ways, and it's, it, it's work. So um, in that one, I did spend a lot of time just conceptually walking my dog, thinking of it, going through the neighborhood, listening, because it's the early 60s, listening to source material from the 60s. So I could nail the, it's just the sonics, the instrumentation. So I limited my instrumentation to instruments from that era, made it simpler. Um, and I knew that I needed a strong melody that I could hang in different ways. And I knew that it, I ended up doing something that was, I think it was like a, it was an odd number of bars, kind of how the length of it. And then I, I knew that I wanted to hammer that home. So I repeated it, modulated it, as opposed to going off in different directions. I wanted it to be a rememberable thing. And then it was a lot of walking around the neighborhood humming, trying to hum a melody that I could retain, that is hummable. Because it's easy when you're sitting here and you just start throwing sounds up, it's easy to kind of get, get mushy. So I needed clarity. And it came together nicely. I would say that uh, I, did a, I did five seasons of Gotham. And Gotham was such a crazy canvas. The show has, you know, it's Bruce Wayne's story, crazy villains, superheroes, love stories, tragedy. It was all over the place, but it gave me an opportunity to do a lot of really operatic, crazy stuff, which I feel if there's anything that I'm good at, I think that's what I'm, I think that it gives me the most pleasure. I don't really know, but I, I mean, I, I'm a, a Swiss army knife in the sense that I've, I've done all kinds of stuff, I've been all over the place. Um, uh, but I think that it, it serves me as a film composer not to have a single style. You know, I haven't been able to say, um, you know, to be, a, to be a guy like Jerry Goldsmith, who's going to work with this orchestra, and, or John Williams particularly. He, you know, he's very consistent in terms of his, this orchestra, maybe a little synthesis. So he's kind of like got one thing that he does, and he's incredibly good at it. Uh, but just the opportunities for me, I've had to go into very different boxes and use different technologies. So I don't know if, it, if a style really comes through. I don't know. Born on a Monday, christened on Tuesday, married on Wednesday, took you long Through my association with Graham, we recorded in London, Vancouver, Bratislava, where else, Seattle. So that was really exciting. I love working with orchestra. I haven't had the opportunity to do it nearly as much. Um, and also, uh, in my early days, I was in a band, and 
met some great musicians that I've continued to work with through the years. Like the guy that played the drums for the theme from Pennyworth was the drummer in my band, you know, who's just an, this guy, David Raven, who's just an amazing drummer. Um, but the, the, the reality of, of my work, at least for the past 20 years, is that most of it is me in this room. You know, the computers enable you to do almost everything, anything you can. I try to pull in um, soloists and small ensembles when I can, but it's, it's, uh, it's rare and, and uh, budgets, budget constraints are real. One reason that I've had whatever career that I've had is that I can let go. So it's important to know what the director doesn't like. You have to, because you have to accept their feeling, even if I've, you know, I've put a lot of effort in, into it, and that's what I, uh, my instinct led me to. I always have to be open. There's a thousand different solutions for any musical question. So I just have to be open to what do we need, you know? So I think it's a collaborative thing and finding what works. So I have no problem. Let it go, you know, put it aside and start over. I think it's a really important ability to have in any kind of collaboration. Piano is my main instrument. Um, I don't practice, I should probably. Um, I'm able to express myself on the piano, but I'm not a pianist. And I, and I learned, I realized at a certain point that I'm not a player. And, I, and I, I, that's fine. Um, play guitar, play saxophone, but the piano is the only instrument I can really express myself on. I'm always updating. Now, these days I've learned, I mean, Back in the old days, you know, a floppy disk that has like one megabyte it was a nightmare. These days, it seems to work by itself. It's very easy to update, but and I constantly have to do it. I would say every time I start a new job, I retool every time. And I, I am trying to expand my sound palette and instruments every single time. And there's always something to learn. Like just right now, you told me about Splice, which I didn't know existed, right? I'd heard of Serum, but I never used it. So no, every time, all the time, and even in the midst of projects. You know, I learned, I started on, I started MIDI with Performer before it was Digital Performer. So I learned it and I never unlearned it. So Digital Performer is the one I stick with. Um, and I lean heavily on the contact instruments and Spitfire. Everybody's got the same stuff. There's nothing uh, exotic that I have. It's all the same stuff. And it's just a question of trying to find a way to express yourself differently, which is not easy. At this point, it's millions of sounds. A big problem is trying to remember what I have. So actually, when I begin a project, I have to go back through these things and play individual sounds just to remember what was there. I do it all the time. I was actually doing it before you came here today, just like, oh yeah. And to, like writing, because like, I'm about to start a new project um, in the DC world called Gotham Knights, Knights with a K. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be seeing episode two uh, in a few days. And I've been, been doing that thing. Like I've got to remember where all this stuff is because it's millions of sounds. I built a, a pretty fat, massive orchestral template. But I find that, and that's on one computer, and then I find that I, I don't build big templates because I have this uh, system, and I don't know if it's clever or not, where I, I keep the number of instruments relatively small, and then I bounce to audio. So that seems to be faster for me. I don't even know if it, because I look at these, um, some of these tutorials, and the guy's got logic, and he's got like just all these virtual instruments. I, I don't do that. Maybe I should, but I don't. I've always liked to keep it simple. Like if you look around the studio, there's not a lot in here. I mean, you know, I got, go, I've seen other composer studios where it's just walls of synths and I've never been able to do that. It's just, I, I, don't, feel, I don't find meaning in it. All I do is, I do look at what's happening on Deadline and IMDb and see what's going on and see if I know people involved with a certain project. And I will reach out and I do send out demos. 
Um, that's what I do. That's all I do. Uh, and, I, and I really try to maintain the relationships that I do have. If you give me eight days to do a score for a, an hour long TV show, I'll do it in eight days. If you give me a year, it's gonna take a year. There's always more you can do. You can always go deeper. So there has to be a willingness to let it go. To, like, and to look at it um, with a clear eye and say, is it serving the scene? Because I got 30 other cues to write, you know? Is it working? Can I come back to it if I have time? So it's that mental uh, gymnastics you gotta go through. But I don't have a problem moving on, letting go. Thank you.